Christine Avray pour le petit... Ah, ça continue, excusez-nous. Nous semblons avoir un... C'est bon Ok, d'accord, merci. Navré pour le petit fond sonore, pas très agréable pour nos oreilles. Euh, bonjour ou rebonjour à tous. Euh, à présent, nous allons nous pencher jusqu'à 15 heures sur l'ancrage local des institutions culturelles, avec euh, tout d'abord euh, une table ronde sur le thème du lieu culturel en bon voisin, et ensuite, un keynote de Sonia Solicari, la directrice du Museum of the Home de Londres, que je salue, euh, qui nous expliquera comment la rénovation du Museum of the Home de Londres a été guidée par cette volonté justement d'être un lieu pour ses publics de proximité. Mais donc, tout d'abord, j'ai l'honneur d'accueillir pour cette table ronde sur le lieu culturel en bon voisin, Lélia Decourt responsable du service de la médiation culturelle et événementielle du MAMAC de Nice. Cécile Dumoulin, qui est responsable du département du développement culturel et des publics du MUSEM de Marseille. Sophie Galéli birkan qui est directrice d'opérations en charge de la diversification chez Altarea. Cécile Rive, administratrice de la Conciergerie Sainte-Chapelle, Tour de Notre-Dame de Paris du Centre des Monuments Nationaux. Et pour la modération de cette table ronde, j'ai le plaisir de passer la parole à Cyril Leclerc, que certains d'entre vous connaissent peut-être, qui est consultant en communication et en marketing culturel euh, des œuvres vives. Voilà, merci beaucoup et cher Cyril, à vous la parole. Merci Annabelle pour l'introduction. Bonjour à tous, bien. Thank you, Annabelle, for that introduction. I can't hear myself anymore. Is that normal? Well, welcome here as a cultural on this workshop on cultural sites as good neighbors. So the development of this ambitious program towards local audiences is increasingly important. The local establishment, Annabelle talked about that as a culture for cultural sites. And then COVID came through and imperiled the models that were based on international footfall. We have a hybrid process, meaning an increased amount of time available. As Gabrielle Altan said, the philosopher, Are we all centurion in a museum? Are monuments only monuments? And should museums be places for sociability? And should they be places that serve culture and general interest as well? Now, I have four guests to talk with me today. Lydia de Cour, you are in charge of events and programming at the MAMAC, the uh, Contemporary Arts Museum from Nice, Cécile Dumoulin. You are in charge of the cultural development for the museum. This is a museum of this uh, European and Mediterranean civilizations. Cécile Reeve, administrator of the Conciergerie in the Saint Chapelle uh, in the National Monument Center, and Sophie Birkan in charge of diversification operations for Alteria. So we'll start with what for most of you was a catalyst in developing your relations policies uh, and also look at COVID and all of that and look at these extraterritorial uh, cultural sites the national, international. I think at MAMAC in Nice, could you tell us a little bit about what went on when you reopened the museum and what were some of the policies that you set up then? Thank you for the invitation to talk to you here. In fact, the Museum of Modern Art and Modern and Contemporary Art is is under the governance of the city of Nice. And in 2019, we had about 140,000 visitors per annum, 60% of those being international. So the issues 
um, at stake for reopening in 2021 were really about a more local policy. So we started thinking in different areas, the first one being retention and developing new, a new proposition. So retaining the local population, first of all, school kids, but we wanted to rethink our offer for the school children, the students. So we needed to mobilize people in the area and the families as well. So developing a family audience as of summer 2020 with a summer offering it was more uh, with greater development there and offering what we called summer at the Ma at the Mamek at the museum with fun activities and uh, digitally based and we developed those over the uh, uh, lockdown so it was more inclusive in terms of our policy it was reconsidering the way we worked just uh, generally uh, in welcoming people in we also wanted to develop a, an offer on based on well-being because as we know the pandemic has been difficult for everybody thinking about projects on art and health and so we wanted to increase our local partnerships with the local volunteer organizations and associations, with the work with the uh, municipal services. Sorry, I keep dropping my papers here. And the municipal services, such as the senior division or people living with impairments, artists, of course, uh, from the area. And then the third area was opening up to performance arts because that's one of the strengths of our museum is creating multidisciplinary events with events that are set locally. So developing performing arts uh, at specific times in the summer. We had a festival in summer 2020. It was called RT Party, which was uh, filling in a gap. We had um, feedback saying that it, that was really good because the Avignon Festival was closed. So it's a way also of supporting artists and promoting cre creativity because performance arts tend to be sort of, um, we had some performance arts um, that were in line with the uh, artwork. Okay, so Sophie Legalini Birkham, you come from a different world, but you also have carried out overall thinking to to get people back into the uh, malls. And you can tell us what Alteria is and how you, and the actions that you carried out. Well, hello, everyone. I am sort of the uh, free floating electron here on this uh, roundtable discussion. So, Alteria, those of you who aren't familiar with us, is the, the, we're the leading real estate developer. And I work for the corporate side. So, um, Corporate properties, we have about 40 assets in France, Spain, and Italy. So they're business assets, all different sizes. We have huge uh, malls, and we have a mall, Capra Mille in uh, Nice. We have Quartz in um, Paris, in the Paris area. We manage these shopping galleries in the train stations, Montpar Montparnasse and, and center villages. and. So I'm in charge of diversification, and it's about bringing in other merchants than just uh, the classic ones, co-working spaces, uh, VR activities, anything other than traditional conventional shopping. So that's my role, and then that's what I was doing. And then along comes COVID, and it strikes us as it did everyone else. So as property developers, well, what happens? Stores are closed, most of them anyway. And what makes the appeal for consumers in, uh, is food, r entertainment, shopping. They're all closed. So, But some of our centers stayed open because we had some of the first necessity businesses, pharmacies, services. And so that was what kept our um, shopping malls or centers alive with different uh, amounts of people allowed to be in, protocols, and so on and so forth. So we would stay open, but only partially open. Sometimes only two stores were open in the whole shopping mall. So we had to manage all of that. 
So a lot of thought went into how we could continue to be a space that mattered for the community. So we sort of became the, an, a, a stakeholder for the local, for the locals there. And so we said, okay, we're going to work in the service of the neighborhood, the quarter, the district, the region. And we had a role to play in healthcare, a volunteers organization. So we, we had a COVID testing centers, vaccination centers, we managed a lot of click and collect, uh, collecting donations, and so there was a social connection there. We knew we had the responsibility there because our centers, if I take the cap 3,000, it's it's 4,000 employees. So we had an original role there as well, and we had to implement, um, we had employment forums, and it was more about service. So we became a community-based actor, if you will. So we went that direction, and we, maintain the connections with our customers. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but getting people back in to the malls, I think it wasn't as difficult because people kept coming in, right? They never actually completely stopped, and there was a high demand for people to open up what was missing, and that was entertainment, culture, our, our arts uh, ex exhibitions needed to be, people were really anxious for all that to open up, so they were really happy when it came around, so no difficulty there. Right, thank you. Cécile Dumoulin, uh, you have Destination Musim, and tell us about, you can tell us about that. We're going to get to see a video. Um, my question then is, once we see the video, is could you tell us what that's all about? And did COVID promote this operation, or was it something that was already in the works? So, if you would please, maybe we could see the video, please. Ah, oui, donc euh, on nous dit que la vidéo est pas encore. Okay, the video isn't ready yet, but let me, before you do see the video, let me tell you what was said. Wait, here's the video. Bien. Je suis content d'aller au musée et de montrer à Brut les œuvres d'art qui sont entreposées à Marseille. Les gens dans mon quartier, ben, en fait, la plupart ils trouvent des excuses pour ne pas y aller. People in my neighborhood find excuses to not go to museums. They say it's too expensive. It's only for rich people. When you live in a neighborhood that's far away, traveling there is tough. Having to pay for museums and movies and all that, it's even more difficult. But with the bus initiative that goes around through our neighborhood and drops you right off at the museum, I think that could be easier. You know. We're not going to the museum. It's almost like the museum is coming to us. So that's fun. We're happy. So if you're not, you know, if you don't have a certain level of culture, well, you can get it. So I didn't want to show you the entire video. It hasn't been edited yet. So, and since we don't have much time here today, I just wanted you to hear the uh, cicadas back there. The kss, 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 kss. You see, it was sh this was shot last summer. This is just to give you an idea of the bus. It's uh, it's an associate. It's a volunteer organization bus. So that was kind of interesting. And what they said, well, our 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 audience before COVID wasn't at all like Mamac or the uh, Paris uh, museums. We'll talk about that in a minute. But um, our audience was say much more balanced between say local and tourists with an international about 25% international. So of course that's important. But we weren't um, f uh, made fragile by uh, many uh, other locations who, uh, during, from COVID because we had a lot of local visitors. We weren't um, uh, bothered by the fact that people from abroad couldn't come. But 
we talked about this, but I think this is shared across the national museums and the French structures. We realized that audiences that were far away and were used to going to uh, museums, in fact, they came less and less, and it was harder for them to come in because you had the uh, vaccination pass, and then you had the uh, health uh, pass where if you weren't vaccinated, you couldn't get in and all that, people coming from Marseille. And so there were other concerns. And then there's the economic uh, difficulties that were increased from the, the pandemic. So for us, why did we want to do this? Well, when we were opening back up in May 2021, we came up with this destination museum, the museum, and to get people in. It was important for us to bring people in. Those of you who are familiar with Marseille, you know that moving around and public transportation in Marseille is a bit of a sticking point, more so than in the Paris area. Uh, for the uh, uh, neighborhoods that are considered public priorities for the public policy, so you have to spend like an hour and a half and have two or three connections, and uh, just and it's even harder on Sundays because there are fewer buses. So we looked at that and we said. It might be interesting, because you have this deficit here, it might be interesting to go out and get the visitors. Offer up this uh, transportation, it's physical transportation. I would say it's also mental transportation, a physical trip and a mental trip. Um, so we worked it out so that uh, when we reopened, we could implement that end of May 2021. So it goes around, the bus runs every Sunday it's a pickup bus, and it's an association. Uh, people, uh, it's a Marseille. It's it's sort of similar, like it's the it's an independent association. It's not the um, local rail or bus association, but it's not a normal city bus. Uh, it's from the 70s, end of the 70s, and it's really interesting because people notice it on the Marseille streets. And so the people like it, and and it's a collector's item. So for a museum, talking about uh, conserving uh, the arts and the, the works in the museum, it makes sense. The connection is made really quickly. So there's there are four different itineraries, and they uh, and it's it's on every Sunday. It runs every Sunday. It's free. Maybe you saw in the movie. There's a a a, a guide on the bus, and so there's preparation that people can uh, get ahead of time depending on the neighborhood. So that's a description of it. Thank you. I'm going to turn to Cécile Rive now. I think that it's 80% of international tourists that you used to have before COVID and you have reinforced an action that already existed, which is Listopad. So what is that tool and how have you relied on it? Thank you for inviting me. I just wanted to clarify because we have, you, there was a glitch in the presentation. The uh, monuments that I manage is not part of RMN, but of the Center of National Monument. So these are 100 mon national monuments throughout France that are very different with different local anchoring. But the characteristics of the Parisian sites is that international tourism is very significant. You're saying 80%. It is the case for the St. Chapel, for Conciergerie at 60%. But these are monuments that welcome hundreds of thousands of visitors beyond a million for the St. Chapel. And when we're struck by a crisis like that, you can feel it, the impact of it right away massively. And what we've decided to do is to capitalize on what we had because we did not discover from one day to the next the ambition or to talk to nearby public. So we've accentuated approaches that we already had rather than reinvent the wheel completely. I'm not going to talk about the schools, um, but I'm going to take the example of the visits with the histopad which already existed at the end of 2016. And it's a tablet that allows you to recreate in 3D the monument at its various parts. For 
called the conciergerie. It's during the medieval and then the revolutionary area. And this tool was being rented before the crisis. So 5 and 7% of the public would get it. We had a great rate of satisfaction, but we didn't impact a lot of the um, public. But with the crisis, we realized that a lot of people picked it up twice as much for the local French public. So there was a real appetite for using this tool. And when you, you need to work on this, we know that it's a long haul effort. And we knew that we could change our model to impact a greatest number. What we've done is to make this tool universal. So every visitor who come to La Conciergerie can visit using the histopad, whether they are uh, free or paying publics. We have 40% of people who don't pay with the people under 26. So we've slightly increased the entry for the people who are paying to amortize the cost and deliver this tool to everyone. And it's extremely interesting because we can see that in a survey that we've carried out at the end of last year, we saw that we had 25% of repeaters. So that's a little bit more than before the crisis. We can't say that it's because of the histopad because a lot of factors are playing. But we can see that the publics who visit the monument with the histopad are roughly better ambassadors for of the monument as well. Their satisfaction is 10 points above the ones who visited it without the histopad. So uh, with the word to mouth, it is spreading. And by offering it to all of our visitors and never letting go of our objective to welcome and continue to welcome the international public with whom we've kept the links with virtual visits. And because it's a tool translated in seven languages, it serves several objectives at once. And it allows us to talk to local publics and international publics because we don't want to change and replace hundreds of thousands of international tourists by hundreds of thousands of local tourists. But everything that we do aims to satisfy all of these publics. So these are changes that were made at the end of the summer. So thank you all for this first answer to this um, first issue. The first one, the second one that I wanted to ask our panel is that we're setting up actions with the public, whether it's local or further away. There's a question of the knowledge of the public. How do we discover the public if we don't know them well? And how do we communicate with them? Because if we set up an action, how do we make it known? We're going to start with Sophie Galilee Birkan with Alterna Commerce. You have decided to act as a good neighbor, and that's a good idea because that's the topic of the conference. You've used digital quite a lot to um, set up a, a way to federate a community. So how did you proceed to start the conversation with this online community? Well, we have sites that are very different. As I said earlier, some of the sites have digi strong digital ecosystems and others not so much. If I take a retail park um, that is peripheral, it's harder to um, facilitate a community, even if we have loyalty cards that allow us to have uh, um, people who subscribe to newsletters. Even the smaller sites have this. Then you have the site that I mentioned earlier. They have a community that is very committed on all social media. And we have a group called the Cap Lovers and they interact on a daily basis by posting a lot of things. So we've really capitalized on this. With the COVID context, of course, we have sent newsletters regularly to inform people and keep this link, but we've added a lot on social media by offering challenges, offering people to post things. We've used some live fashion shows as well. We have fully used all of the digital means in order to make sure that we were maintaining a daily link with these communities. Thank you. Other place, other issue with the MUSEM.
So for the Musel, Cécile Dumoulin, the destination Musem operation is targeting a public that is far away geographically and you might not have, uh, you're not used to interact with them. So how do you make sure that such a public gets known? Well, that's a big question. We continue to ask ourselves. We are testing a lot of things, but of course it is the sinew of war. We have started with what was the easiest, which is uh, the um, equality of chances and all of the network of the contacts of the charities and social structure across the territory. And it's quite historically rich in Marseille, but it's been losing ground for several years. and. COVID not helping, we all realized that often they had other concerns as well. So we have relied, first of all, on them because it was important to have them in the loop. But then we've just tried to diversify it. We've worked a lot with the um, local stores who are um, ambassadors that are closer to the population. They um, interact with a broader population. Um, a lot of the um, managers of social housing, we've also worked with high schools and junior high, and we've also done an action with volunteers of the civil um, duty. I spoke about 22 bus stops, which are 22 different neighborhoods. So in terms of work to go and get these publics, to inform them and to make them want to go, because you can't just set up a vehicle and inform them. You also want, need to make them want to do this. And it's a long time work. Thank you very much. Then, Lilia, on your side, you have a field experience that allow you to uh, know these publics well and to identify some targets, especially student targets and family targets. So how have you proceeded with these publics? We don't really have a well-defined public study over the uh, past several years. It's more a field experience. Personally, I've been serving the publics for 12 years with the museum, so I'm starting to know my public rather well. And on everything that is the communication of the activities that we carry out, it's more complicated because we were pooling this with the direction of culture. So it's more complicated to develop our activities with social media. Even if we have an Instagram account, it's not enough. So our priority was through our experience to identify publics that are far away, that are not coming, and just to go there, to move there, and to identify partners that are going to be able to contribute this public um, lacking. So we also have the public that is in the valleys. You have the city of Nice, so you have the coastline, but the valley behind it. And one that is the Valley of La Hoya, which is nearing Italy, and it's been very damaged. It's seen the migration crisis since 2015. And recently, it's been um, uh, devastated by Storm Alex. So we uh, created an, a roaming um, guide with a comedian and to just go and offer this in all of the schools of the valley, going from Bressoya all the way to Tonde. So it was about 250 school children who were um, contacted and 90% of the publics that we saw during that week as nomads never came to the museum. Moreover, 100% wanted to come. So it was quite a good success. Other public that we identified that weren't coming are the younger people. They're the students. They're very absent from our museum. So how do we mobilize them? Well, it's already something that we'd started before COVID. It is something that we continue to try to develop, especially in partnership with the Côte d'Azur University 
It is part of the university that is classified edX with more subsidies on well-targeted project with a culture division. We've created something with a remix of culture, so it invites everybody to um, offer a mediation within the museum. We've tried to reinforce this proposal at the end of 2021 for a, another event by offering a culture bonus to the students. So additional note to take part in this is to be supported on mediation with for some workshops. Unfortunately, it was a little bit of a failure, and I think that it's good to talk about it because even if we're deploying plenty of things, there are things that are just not working. And in 2019, we had close to 90 students who had mobilized themselves. And in 2021, when we had multiplied the workshops and the proposals, we only had four. So we continue to learn from this. Well, we learn from our mistakes, don't we? So, Cecile, we were saying that you have a large part of first-time visitors. And in this context, how are you able to reinforce their loyalty in a context that is quite competitive? So how are you able to have this public of first-time visitors while trying to create a loyalty with your your local visitors? I'm what support what my colleague said, especially Cecilie Poulain, by saying that the loyalty of the public is the sinew of war. You might have a great cultural programming that is very varied with a ton of visits. If you don't have the channels to touch the public, you're very quickly disappointed by the um, people. And in Paris, it is complicated to survive with the abundance of cultural offers here. And I mentioned the histopad but we've also multiplied the family and young adult options for over the weekend. So because we knew we were going to impact um, visits from young adults who can't come during the week. So we have um, escape games, mystery games, um, discuss visits. We do a ton of things. But where things are complicated is to have uh, the loyalty of people who can come back to the monument for various cultural events. So thankfully, today we have a certain number of tools that are being developed, even if we're starting this approach. And the seat at the center of the monuments are developing um, monuments. So in each of the um, administrators, you're looking for a um, public that you can better impact with all sorts of information and newsletters that can support this. This means, for instance, for sites like mine and others, is that now that we have a part of the ticketing that is important, we need to see how our databases are interesting and how we can use these databases in order to communicate regularly with publics that are coming back. And the bet that we're making that might not yield uh, fruit right away, but it, I think it's a good one, is to work uh, more as a network, as a regional network. Because if we take the case of the CNM in Paris, it's not just La Sainte-Chapelle and La Conciergerie. It's also uh, the Pantheon, the Chapelle de Vincennes. Um, and there are many beautiful monuments. And we can just uh, also share our public between these various monuments. And we can do it because a public that is going to go to the Pantheon because it wants to do uh, evening visits with um, a light is going to enjoy escape games in La Conciergerie. Somebody who's going to enjoy uh, um, the revolution at La Conciergerie is going to enjoy conferences on the topic of the revolution in the Chapelle Expiatoire because getting people to come back several times to a document, to a monument, you're not going to come back during the same year 10 times to the same document. So the same family can, through a diversified offer, go to the Pantheon, to the Hotel de la Marine, and to the Conciergerie. And the next year, they'll come back with another offer in the same monument. 
but it's it's a good bet to play the network. So we're working to make sure that our newsletters are more regional because up until now, each monument had its tool, its tools, its data, its database, and this way we can proceed in order to better target. There are other offers that we can use nationally that we can use regionally. I'm taking the case of the subscription of CNM that offers you um, the access to the monument for a whole year dur uh, during a whole year it has dedicated offers as well. You can be invited to concerts, conferences, exhibitions. If you are in the greater Paris area, it's worth it for 45 euros to go to various sites of your region. And when you're in vacation all over France, you can also take advantage of this. So these are in the logic of the network of the 100 monuments, but they can also uh, make the public more loyal locally. We're going to stay with you, Cecile, by listening to you and listening to these various operations of diversification and reinvention. We can wonder about whether we're not far away from the purpose and the mission of each of these structures. In the Conciergerie and the St. Chapel, you're not trying to evade the question of the meaning of the place, and every action must serve the history of the monument. Absolutely, and I think it's the case of all of my colleagues around this table, and everything that is at stake is to have a visit offers that are quite original, and if we didn't suggest them, there's a certain number of publics that would have never visited us, but we need to keep a strong link with the monument. It needs to be a real invitation to discover the place. If I take the example of the escape games that we are very numerous to do, they already worked well before the crisis, but we've changed it by mystery game, a paranormal mystery game uh, at the Conciergerie. It is working really well, but in the way in which we think about this type of offer, we're being very cautious to work with a theater company. We work together on the scenario to really make sure that it echoes the monument and its spaces and its characters, and that the monument is not just a decor for a commercial operation, saying it's all nice and fine to do it there, but the idea is to that it's another entry into the monument. To take this example, we're also very cautious at the end of the game to be able to explain to the participants what was fictitious and what was real. And we also send it by email at the end of the visits. And I think it's really important. And when we, when we question the people who participate, many families, many young adults, they say that they wouldn't have come to the monument if we hadn't had this type of proposal to be made. Thank you very much. I'm now turning to Lilia. Lilia, you have decided to place inclusivity at the center of your strategy. It's even a central aspect. So can you say a few words about this? So for us, the principle was not to stay far away from our mission, but it was also to reinforce one of the key missions of the museum, which was to recenter on some uh, in-depth topic, topics that we did not have the time to do. But one of the mission is to make this accessible to the greatest number and not just limit ourselves to those who come naturally. And during the COVID break, uh, it was very um, anchored in um, the territory by um, committing to doing something about cultural inequality, to refuse exclusion, to broaden our field to partnership, to create social links with the um, no local nonprofits, develop activities outside the walls, and also um, promote part long-term partnerships because we can see that it's working rather well. One of the projects that we've carried out was with the prison in Nice, where we prisoned some educational project either um, in the um, prison or by having the 
uh, prisoners come to the museum. We've also tried to create these processes to make it a more inclusive museum. We work with a committee of users that we have created. It is composed of people with disabilities, but also neighbors, people who come regularly to the museum, local partners, uh, but also um, the town hall partners and the objective of the committee is to identify the needs of the museum to make it a space that is accessible to all of these publics and uh, in an autonomous way and to set up a, a um, welcoming policy that is viable over time. And this group project is going to be deployed over time. It started in September of 2021 with various stages. Right now, it is predominantly a sensitization of the teams, whether these teams are teams that um, are welcoming or digital teams or uh, guide teams. We're rewriting a common lexicon with some um, communication material. We have partnerships. We have joint cultural activities. And so in this way, we're uh, approaching this in various stages. The first one is going to be information and the creation of uh, uh, documents that are easy to read and to understand. Cécile, this is, uh, the museum is a national museum, but it's also a society museum that touches upon contemporaneous, contemporaneous um, questions it is also uh, talking about what's at stake and what's key at this moment. How is this implantation making sense in this project for the Musen? Indeed, we are a societal museum, and sometimes we tend to forget it, but our roots for the National Museum and the Art and Popular Traditions remind us of this. We have a user committee that we've set up since 20. Uh, 11. We've had it for 11 years now, and it's very structural in a societal museum to be a part of this. It's hard to talk to people about them without having them take part in the thought process. So it's also complicated to be in a society museum that is not part of the society because there are some mobility issues or because there are some issues of uh, um, fear of the cultural uh, venue, which have been well documented. There's a social rupture in the way in which the museum is perceived and visited. And we saw it in our um, usership and in our public data. This has been further reinforced by COVID. So Destination Musen is a project that really wants to be sustainable, and that's the difference with what we did before. I am focusing on that, but of course, we also have projects that target publics that are far away. We've done a lot of them since we opened in 2013. These were essentially mixed projects that were in various shapes and forms. We've had participative projects inside the exposition with somebody like Barbara Gassin, for instance. But every time it was very ad hoc. And here the idea is to do something that is going to be anchored into the territory. And its ambition is going to be to change the practice of the museum over the long term. It is also digital. It's not just projects that are just nice and fine, but we sometimes feel that there are little drops in the ocean. This is why I said earlier that it's a long-term project that deserves to have its own time. Currently, the buses are not always full. Sometimes we have to cancel some of them during the dead of winter because the exhibitions are not always adjusted to a family-type public. But it doesn't matter. It's something we really want to carry out over time in order to modify the behaviors, but also the image of the museum and to have a back and forth, if you will. Obviously, we just don't want to pick up people from their home and bring them home. 
there is a move that is physical and mental that we're suggesting, and we're also moving by going to them, and that's very important. And with we have a, a nomad exhibition on the Mediterranean cuisine in line with one of our exhibition, which is called The Great Medze, and it's going to be born at the museum, then it's going to be a nomad through the neighborhoods. So the idea is to really build a relationship with the territory anchored into this territory. Thank you very much. Sophie, to wrap up on this, and before we move to the questions from the public, uh, our goal is to set up an experience that is integrated in the daily lives of people. And when we prepared the conference, you spoke about this hybrid aspect of the place, of this third party venue, if you will, that you're setting up uh, within the stores that are managed by Altaria. So do you feel that this could be a model for cultural places? Yes, indeed. In both of these aspects that we're going to strongly work on, there is the retailtainment, which is to say, I have a mall or a commercial site, or it can even be a district. We have the city centers where we have um, accommodations, offices, um, nearby store. The idea is to say, I'm not just going there to shop. My purpose is not just to go there, f to go through a series of stores. What we're trying to do is make sure that people come back and that they come back ideally every day, that they spend as much time as possible. And in order to this, we're going to prepare uh, a lot of activities that really make it a real space for living. It's to switch from the shopping center to a life center or a community center in a little bit in the um, American sense. And then the mall can become a place where I can rent a space to do a family celebration and I can leave my children. Uh, in some centers, you have some assistance for homework or I could have a, 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 a DIY um, workshop or a lesson. And yes, I did shop and maybe I renewed my um, identification documents because um, the, the city hall was there and I had um, blood work done because everything comes there, the B2C, the B2B. It's a place to live, to share, to experience. And that's our ambition. It's a mix between the retail tailment and being um, a provider of service. And culture is essential in this because the notion is to uh, give access to culture and to education and to many different things. It's one of the components, if you will. Thank you. Ideas to be picked up for cultural spaces, for sure. Um, I was going to ask you all to get to know what the results are for the projects that you had following that. But I think we're going to have to give a priority to the questions out in the audience. So um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. I think you have a mic back there for that, if you have any questions. Bonjour, vous m'entendez? Oui, on vous entend bien. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. We're very lucky to have uh, people here from the private and public sectors. Do you have any examples of, say, hybrid projects uh, you're involved in or that you know of in uh, the public and uh, cultural and, uh, and private as well, Cécile? We talked about the uh, CMN project to uh, add some uh, sites, but well, not in my monument because the spaces are very small. So today, even I don't have a an education room when I have uh, all the school, uh, all the students. I have to uh, w welcome them in the uh, public spaces. But we're lucky to have a hundred over a hundred monuments across the territory so we can work on the idea of establishment through hybridization in fact so we have a we had a an, an RFQ 
just for this thing, for that type of thing, exactly, experimenting for over one year in several different monuments, say two examples are monuments involved. We have the Chateau in Angers and the Chateau of Jocigny. So a lot of monuments have internal and external spaces or gardens and that, that can be really spotlighted in this uh, hybridization. So here, what we're looking for is to completely be involved in the local territory, starting with the dynamic, with the local dynamic, not at all top down, but uh, starting from the social fabric, imagine uh, maybe local uh, solidarity initiation initiatives, maybe vaccination centers. We even tried that and we thought about it, but for many complex reasons, so things didn't work out. Logistically, it's not so simple. But we are definitely in this rationale, thinking that ultimately monuments should be a place where life takes place, where people can imagine contemporary use. So our heritage, our buildings, and that are not just uh, to be looked at and admired. So we can imagine co-working, many things in the territories, but perhaps one of my colleagues from the National Monument Center will come and talk to you about some things that we're talking about next year. But it's definitely part of our um, desire. Any other questions from the room? Non, pas de, pas de si un petit oui. truc Let me just add something slightly different here. At Museum, just shortly after the opening, the reopening, or our, shortly, sorry, shortly after the opening, 2015, I believe. It's a regist historically registered monument. So we had a concept store where we have every year that we offer up to uh, different uh, associations of local artisans, craftsmen, come in and sell their productions. And we offer also events that are connected to what we do. So there's the idea of this hybrid initiative works and then every, and more occasionally, every year we have a plants festival with lots of, uh, say, horticulturists. So, and so we, there are several different events, not just a single commercial activity. Meaning at the same time we have workshops, we've got a, a garden with gardeners who come in and do demos and things like that, and even grow things. So it's a, it's flexible, uh, educational, and people can come in. The idea is uh, about uh, sharing information and that. OK, I think there are no further questions, but maybe we have a little time left. So this public, this audience coming into your bus, it's kind of a young thing, OK? The bus isn't so young because uh, it's a, a, an antique, but what about the carbon impact? Are there things imagine like to limit that in the future? Um, yes, of course. We thought it made perfect sense to bring the audiences, the public in in these buses, but it's true, uh, a bus from 1978 that's not electric. So the first thing we looked at was changing the engine it can be done. We've never, it's not been done yet on a public transportation vehicle, on uh, in individual vehicles it's been done, private vehicles it has been done, but we realized that, in fact, that the cost is uh, just way too high. We are getting a patron for that. See, the NG uh, Foundation, NG wanted to do it, but in fact it's just way over uh, what their contribution is. So it was unfortunate. And now we're looking at the carbon offset instead by integrating plants, replant, plant, planting uh, in trees and, and green plants in um, neighborhoods with the shared gardens, sh shared vegetable gardens, so it's proactive, participative, and uh, community-based. Any other questions? Right, I don't see any hands going up. I've got tons of questions, and I'm going to keep going. And I think that 
museums or your museums are going to go into a phase of a renovation. So is this not a time to continue your thought about your, your connection with the public? Sure. The museum is going to be is going to undergo renovations. Uh, looking at a green, uh, a linear park. So we'll shut down for two hours, or sorry, two uh, years. And thinking about projects, can you still hear me? Yeah, can projects uh, outside the walls? We're looking at what we can do. And I wanted to react to the question there earlier and the relationship to a third location or an outside location. We're thinking about that. We're definitely looking at that, how to address spaces that are not necessarily set up to accommodate art, but in, that could end up being amazing. A few years back, I did this. There was a young woman who saw a, an exhibition in a, a mall in Nice. It was based on Yves Klein. Yves Klein. And we got there, and, and she wasn't familiar with the artist at all, but we have an entire room uh, a unique, it's unique.